Hello and welcome to Tech Deals MSI Z370 Crate Gaming Motherboard Unboxing Overview Small Comparison CPU Look and Generally Should You Buy This Motherboard and Is It a Deal? Spoiler alert, yes it is. In fact, if you're looking for a good motherboard for overclocking with lots of features but that costs less than some of the premium boards, if you're looking for a board that provides future expandability, all the ports you need, excellent audio and excellent LAN, buy this board. Now, there are some additional features and reasons to spend more than this. The M5 board, the Gaming Pro Carbon, we'll talk about those in just a few minutes. But this is the lowest level board that MSI currently makes that I would put a K-chip onto. And if you're doing a nice mid-level system of $1,000 or higher, I wouldn't go lower than this. The Tomahawk board is nice, the SLI Plus is nice, but this is a better board than those. It has better power delivery, better voltage regulators on it. It does have a better sound chip than those boards do. It's got the 1200 series versus 800. This is really the bottom end of the boards that I would personally recommend. And frankly, it's not that much more expensive. You're looking at 10 or $20 more for this board than you are for the SLI Plus or the Tomahawk. I do think it's worth the money. Now, whether it's worth the money to step up to that board is a personal choice. AC Wi-Fi and a few other features, but they're very similar. Once you get above this board, all the other boards, not counting the godlike gaming, are actually quite similar. Now, first, a quick recap if you're not familiar. The Z370 chipset is for the new 8th generation of Coffee Lake CPUs. You can see some of those sitting here. It is currently in November of 2017 when I'm filming this, the only available chipset for those CPUs. Sometime in 2018, B360 and H370 boards, less expensive boards, will be coming. Those will not allow overclocking, however. Those are primarily for the non-K chips. You can use the K chips in them, but then you can't overclock. They are going to, of course, have fewer features, lack SLI support, a few other things, but perhaps you might want to wait for them if you're looking at a non-K chip and you want to save a little money. That being said, you can now find Z370 boards for right around $100 or just over, and if you're looking for something right now, the price difference between a quality H370 board and a Z370 is only going to be maybe $20 or so. I wouldn't wait six months to buy your new CPU for a $20 motherboard price difference personally. Now, as I said at the beginning of this video, this is the lowest level motherboard I would install these on. That's because of the voltage delivered, the VRMs on it. It's got more power phases than the Tomahawk and the SLI Plus and the boards below it do. The power delivery system on this board is the same that's on the M5 for nearly $200, the same that's on the Gaming uh, Pro Carbon. Now, the Godlike, which is $500, and frankly, I don't recommend, I'm sorry, MSI, I love you, but no, that's crazy. Now, that has a fancier system, but that board's more expensive than most X299 boards, so skip the Godlike and look at either the M5, the Gaming Pro Carbon, or this if you're looking for a K-chip, uh, such as the i7-8700K to overclock. That being said, because of the excellent price of this board, would I install an i5-8400 on this? Yes, I would. This is generally found under $150, but it still has Intel Gigabit Ethernet. It still has the Realtek ALC1220, which is the new chip that has the high signal-to-noise ratio, the good sound quality. The boards below this have the old 800 series audio chip, so it's got better audio on it, SLI and Crossfire support, of course. Gen 2. USB 3.1 support, that's important, 10 gigabit per second if you care about that. The boards below this generally only have Gen 1. So again, for an extra 10 or $20, you're adding a bunch of little checkboxes, better power delivery, USB Gen 2, and so on. Now, because these two boards have the same power delivery system, they should overclock the same. Now, of course, I haven't tested this yet. It is still new, but I have built a system using the Gaming Pro Carbon. The i7-8700K had no problem going to 5 gigahertz on all six cores, stock voltage, 1.35 volts, no problem, using a large tower cooler. I actually have a Dark Rock Pro 3 from Be Quiet installed on that board. On a different board I've installed using the same CPU, a 280 millimeter liquid cooler, also no problem, 5 gigahertz. So you should get 5 gigahertz on this with appropriate cooling. Now there will be a build video on this coming up very shortly, so if you're not subscribed to my channel, make sure you're subscribed to be able to view that build video when it comes up. In addition, link down in the description below will be everything I talk about in this video, as is with all of my videos. I'll link this board, I'll link the M5, I'll link this one, and the CPUs. I do encourage you to check those out. To be completely honest, when it comes to the board selection, it really is personal preference. Here's the short version. This has more RGB lighting. This has AC Wi-Fi. This doesn't. And this has 
Yeah, that's pretty much it. It just basically comes down to AC Wi-Fi and better RGB lighting. It does come with a few extra minor things in the box. For the price difference, which generally runs about $30 to $40, it comes down to do you want built-in AC Wi-Fi? Do you want, in fact, superior lighting? Do you want maybe a sharper looking board? It does have the M2 heat shield for the top NVMe PCI Express slot if you care about such things. The differences are minor. It's really aesthetic and appearance isn't just what you personally want. If you're on a budget, perhaps you're doing the i3 or the i7K chip and you want to overclock those for your application, this might be more suited to those. But I would not hesitate to install an i7-8700K in this given its power delivery system. And with all that being said, now we're going to open this up and take a look at what is inside. Yes, as you can see, it's a motherboard. Okay. I've now taken everything out of the box. Let's see what we've got. First things first, SLI high bandwidth bridge. Now, okay, granted it's not RGB and fancy, but I'd like to point out that you could easily spend $20 or more buying one of these. If you want to run two 10 series NVIDIA cards in SLI, you're going to need one. Most under $150 boards often don't come with these. Some do. It's nice to see that it's included just in case you need one. We have our I.O. shield for the back of your computer case, and it is silk screen black, so it looks very nice, matches the board, and has all the various symbols on it. This is an RGB extension cable. Not only does this have some RGB lighting on it, but it also has the RGB ports to add additional RGB strips to it or RGB fans or other RGB components if you want. This is nice that it's included. Now, what's interesting is the back of the box of this actually says... RGB extension cable not included, and yet there was one inside the package. Now, of course, I can't guarantee you'll get one in every box, but it was in there. Please note, not a press sample. I bought this from Amazon with my own money. That was a press sample, but this was not. These companies send me things. They don't send me everything. Four serial ATA data cables, which is two more than a lot of these boards come with. Usually the 200R boards are where you're going to see four of these. The fact that an under $150 board has that is very nice. We have a driver CD, which you shouldn't need because you should be going to MSI's website to download the latest software, but it's there in case you need it. A registration card. I do recommend you register your board with MSI. It makes warranty support easier should you ever need it. I have actually had to use warranty support in the, fast, in the past a few years ago. It is once you register your board and put the number in, it's very simple and straightforward. You send your thing off, they take care of you. It's about a 10-day turnaround, but their support has always been good to me in the past, at least the one time that I had to use it. Stickers for marking off your cables. You wrap these around your cables and mark them if you use them. If you're not a fan of manuals, a quick installation guide. This basically shows you how to install a motherboard, how to install a CPU. Now, if you are not familiar with doing this, A, watch tutorial videos, B, read the manual. But I understand it can be overwhelming, so it's nice that they include it. I have to give props for MSI's manuals. They have definitely improved in the past few years. A couple of years ago, I would have said that ASUS had the best manuals in the business, and they still are excellent, but MSI's have improved tremendously. This is all in one language with all the information, both in the BIOS and all the features on the board, and it definitely is a cut above some others. I do like this. It's got everything documented, so very good. And here you can see the board in all of its glory. Now, as I said before, it does not have as much RGB lighting on it as, say, the Gaming Pro Carbon does. But if you don't care about that, you don't care about the AC Wi-Fi, frankly, it's extremely similar in all other respects. Both have the 1200 series Realtek ALC audio. Both of them have an Intel Gigabit Ethernet LAN. Both of them have USB Gen 2 3.1. Both of them have the two uh, M.2 slots. They both have six SATA ports. They both have basically pretty much similar features. Same power delivery, as I mentioned mentioned before, just style differences, quite frankly. Now, as far as ports and connections, you do have a whole bunch of uh, fan headers, liquid pump headers, etc. case fan headers up here on the top and a couple on the bottom. You have the six SATA ports here, as I mentioned. You do have two USB 3.0 ports here for the front of your case. If you've got a case that has four USB 3 ports, that's really, really nice because you can hook all of them up there. And there's two USB 2 headers down on the bottom for connecting various devices. There is a COM port down there. There's the front panel headers, the front panel audio headers there, and so on. It's all very, very standard. One nice thing, both of the X16 PCI Express slots have the steel shields around them, which is nice. When you go below this level, as I mentioned before, you start giving up features, the Tomahawk and the S11 
SLI Plus only have a single uh, protector. Even though they do support multiple graphics cards, the second one isn't doesn't have the metal shield on it. So which board should you buy? Now, so far I've only talked about MSI. Really briefly, I will have an upcoming video soon that's a which Z370 should you buy that's a full line review of all the different brands. ASRock, Gigabyte, MSI, uh, Asus. On my test bench back there, I've had a bunch of different boards. The ASRock uh, Killer SLI, the ASRock Tai Chi has been there, the Gigabyte Gaming Ultra, and the Gigabyte Gaming 7. The ASUS ROG Strix has been back there, the Z370-E board. This board has been there, and then by the time you watch this, this will be there as well. Every one of those boards have all hit 5 gigahertz on the i7-8700K at 1.35 volts. I'm finding it's extremely easy to overclock versus the KB Lake chips, which were not. Now, if you go below this level of board, I mentioned power delivery. If you go with the SLI Plus or the Tomahawk or any of the other lower boards from the other companies, yes, you may have trouble getting that kind of overclock because the, the voltage regulators and the power phases are lower. But once you get up to these level boards, that's generally not the distinction. Now, let me be clear. I'm talking about 5 gigahertz overclocking. These chips will go faster. 5.2, 5.3 is possible. Open loop cooling, the Tai Chi with its 13 uh, phase power delivery, those might be necessary if that's what you're interested in doing. I don't do that on my channel. I do easy. 5 gigahertz is easy. It'll take you five minutes, go in, set a few things, don't even mess with voltage, and you'll be good to go. When you go beyond that, it starts to get a little bit more custom and expensive. So I generally recommend you stick to 5 gigahertz. It's simple, straightforward, cool running, and fairly easy to set up. Like the video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe using that big, huge red button. You should be subscribed to my channel anyway. Comments and questions in the comment section, and please check the links in the video description. All the boards I described, the CPUs will all be linked down there. Please check those out. There will also be a link to my playlist of all the performance reviews of the 8700K. Check those out as well. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in my next video.